Okay, well, welcome everybody to this DASI seminar. Today is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Petar Belichkovic. Sorry if my pronunciation is not uh, correct. He is a staff research scientist at DeepMind, affiliated lecturer at the University of Cambridge, and an associate of Clare Hall, Cambridge. Dr. Belichkovic holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Cambridge, Trinity College, and his research is focused on geometric deep learning, particularly on graph representation learning and its applications in algorithmic reasoning. For instance, he is the first author of Graph Attention Networks and Deep Graph Infomax. I want to thank Peter for very kindly accepting our invitation. And whenever you are ready, the floor is all yours. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks very much, Pablo, for inviting me. Thank you for the fine introduction and thank you everyone for coming to my talk today. As you might have seen from the title, the topic of today's talk will be geometric deep learning. And uh, this is a topic that's been very fresh on my mind for the past few years, uh, a topic I've written and co-written quite a bit of text about. So it's one that uh, I am excited to share uh, with you about today, and I hope uh, that there will be some opportunity for interesting discussions as well as uh, uh, as well as interesting questions, or maybe even some ideas that you can take away and apply in your own research. But um, in case you're not particularly familiar with uh, our geometric deep learning work. Um, you might not necessarily immediately see the cause for why we might want to talk about geometry and deep learning in the same sentence, or what do I even mean when I say geometry? So in order to be able to talk about these things a lot more effectively, and for me to explain how do these terms intertwine so much, I actually need to take you back in time. And that's why the first slide says going back in time. And when I say going back in time, I really mean way back in time. So, you know, several hundreds of years BC to the days of Euclid. Now, as many of you probably know, Euclid created what we now know as Euclidean geometry, which uh, uh, governs uh, through a collection of Euclidean postulates, the way in which uh, objects are geometrically organized uh, around the plane, right? Uh, or more generally what we call Euclidean space nowadays. And specifically, one of the centers of it is the parallel postulate, which says that when you're in a plane and there is a line and a point not on the line, there's exactly one other line that is parallel to that uh, line that goes through that point. Now, for many, many centuries, uh, Euclidean geometry was the way to do geometry. Like if you were doing geometry, this is what you were doing. And many people believed it to be absolutely correct. And as a result, many mathematicians over the years tried to ascertain that, in fact, Euclidean geometry is perfectly consistent and is the universal way to do geometry. So several people tried to go about doing this by um, basically exploiting the fact that you could try to assume the parallel postulate is false and then try to drive a contradiction. However, what actually happened, and it happened around the 1800s, was this massive explosion of new possible geometries that uh, arised when uh, these mathematicians realized that actually assuming the parallel postulate to be false does not derive a contradiction. In fact, it derives completely consistent geometries that respect all the other postulates and just operate in a space that looks very different. The first such known result came through the work of Flobachevsky and Bolyai that ended up discovering what we now know as hyperbolic geometry, which is a world in which you can draw more than one line that are parallel to a given line. And in fact, uh, when this discovery was first made, it was quite, uh, quite remarkable. In fact, uh, Bolyai uh, famously wrote to his father saying that he discovered such wonderful things that he was amazed. Out of nothing, he has created a strange new universe. And the picture only got more and more complicated with some follow-up works, for example, the great work of Riemann that, among others, uh, derived what we now know as elliptic geometry, where, in fact, because the uh, points live on this elliptic space, there exist no parallel lines whatsoever. All lines have to cross. So, you know, it goes without saying the 1800s were a very exciting time to be studying geometry. There were all sorts of different geometries being proposed, all coming with their own vocabulary, all coming with their own set of rules. And it was really tricky, say, if you were someone who was just entering the area, what is the geometry that you should be studying? What is the one true geometry, right? Right. 
this was a question that was very much floating on everybody's minds. And fortunately, a solution to this issue came only a couple of decades later through the work of this mathematician on the picture here, Felix Klein, who had uh, at the time just accepted a professorship post at the uh, Bavarian University of Erlangen in Germany. And uh, as part of his research program there, he proposed what is now known eponymously as the Erlangen program, uh, uh, basically something that eventually guided us to the solution of this problem, which is there is actually a blueprint that allows you to unify all of the existing geometries uh, by talking about invariances and symmetries. So what are the quantities preserved under this particular geometry and particular symmetry group actions? And you can use indeed group theory to formalize these transformations. Now, uh, Felix Stein's Erlangen program, it was a very massive idea. It had a massive effect both in mathematics and beyond. Um, and it's really hard to overstate its impact. Obviously, in the domain of geometry, it served as a blueprint that then led mathematicians uh, that were able to several decades later to use it to unify all of the geometries that were uh, that were conceptualized at the time. And uh, the final formalizations happened through the work of Ely Cartan in the 1920s. However, beyond the massive effect it had on mathematics, it also had a tremendous spillover effect in physics, specifically mainly through the work of Emmy Noether, who was uh, Felix Klein's colleague, uh, and she approached this problem from a physics perspective and actually realized that using similar, uh, similar rules, you can derive all of the laws of conservation in physics by considering symmetric properties. This, was, this had a massive effect, not only in the way we think about physics, but also allowed us to use group theoretic constructions to arrive at very modern day uh, topics such as the standard model, which arises as the irreducible representations of certain groups. And also there were massive spillover effects in computer science. In fact, uh, category theory, which is an abstract branch of mathematics that nowadays has a lot of implications to computer science research. In the words of its very creators, Eilenberg and McLean, category theory is just an extension of Felix Klein's Erlangen program where uh, group theory is replaced by categories, uh, functors, and naturality. Now, at this point, even though this is such a cool program to think about and obviously was a very impactful idea, you might be wondering, why the hell am I telling you about all of this? Because I, you know, I'm giving you a talk on a seminar that's related to deep learning, and I haven't mentioned a bit of deep learning yet. I've just talked about these very interesting but not particularly related mathematical ideas. So why am I telling you about this? Well, let's think a little bit about deep learning, right? What does deep learning look like nowadays, say circa the year 2020? Well, you can actually see that there's a lot of interest in the field. There's a lot of concurrent ideas being proposed. And a lot of those ideas tend to have uh, their own language attached to them because the people proposing them either came from language processing or image processing or you know temporal sequence processing or things something like that. Each domain kind of comes with its own language, its own set of assumptions, and the architectures are often accompanied with these kinds of bombastic statements like uh, you know everything's a special case of a convolution. Long short-term memories are Turing complete, so why would you ever need anything else? Graph neural networks operate on graphs. Everything is a special case of a graph structure. Transformers use self-attention, and as we know, attention is all you need. All those kinds of things, you know, they might lead to someone who is brand new into the field to go around asking the question, what is the one true architecture? And to be honest, when you when you if you were to ask me about it, the state of deep learning in our current present decade doesn't feel all that different to how geometry must have felt in the 1800s. And in this particular case, if history is really to teach us anything, we might want to look back to the principles of the past to try to, rather than answer the question of what's the one true architecture, give a more qualified answer that allows us to generate all architectures under a common blueprint. Now, I do a lot of my research in graph representation learning, where the central model of interest is the graph neural network. And I often get asked the question, could graph neural networks be the answer to this question? And to be fair, I would argue that the, that the answer is likely yes. So that is because if you squint hard enough, most of the neural networks that you come across uh, in your day-to-day -day research can actually be seen as passing messages over a particular graph structure. Here I've given you just specific cases of those graph structures when you have fully connected MLPs, when you have convolutional networks, and when you have recurrent networks. There is a very clear computational graph 
telling you how data is passed between the nodes in this case. So I don't think it's inconceivable that graph neural networks could play a part in this one true architecture. But in order to understand that, you need to also understand graph neural networks beyond their basic premise, which is permutation equivariance. So with all that said, now it is our turn to study geometry. My name is Petr Velichkovic. I'm a staff research scientist at DeepMind and an affiliated lecturer at Cambridge. And alongside Michael Bronstein, John Bruna, and Taco Cohen, I have been deeply thinking about these issues for the past couple of years. And we have summarized our thoughts in a proto book on geometric deep learning, where, which we have made publicly available on geometricdeeplearning.com, along with lots of accompanying materials, talks, lecture courses, blog posts, code, and all that stuff. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. If anything I tell you today strikes your interest, but in reality, what I'll be telling you about today is a bit of a whirlwind journey through the ideas that we have conceptualized in this book. So that is what we'll be talking about today. Now, let's dive into it. Well, before we dive into it, let's think a little bit about why do we even care about invoking geometry in machine learning, right? Because we know for a fact by the universal approximation theorems that uh, even if you take the most straightforward neural network, like a multilayer perceptron below, with all of your data concatenated as its input, that is still in principle going to be powerful enough to fit any kind of problem you want, any real bounded continuous function. Well, the problem is that when we do deep learning, we are inadvertently learning these functions over a high dimensional space. And learning in high dimensions is something that is super intractable. You probably know this problem already under the guise of curse of dimensionality. But basically what it means is that even if you restrict your target functions to be really nice, well-behaved, like for example, doesn't change more than one Lipschitz, which means your function is not allowed to change too much at any particular point, you can still construct a very nasty counterexample of this target function here that has these carefully placed Lipschitz peaks, right? That are just not peaky enough to fail the condition for Lipschitzness. But as you increase the number of dimensions that you're fitting the sphere in, you need exponentially more training points in red to properly fit what that function really is. And that is what we call the curse of dimensionality. As the number of dimensions you're fitting your problem in increases, even for really simple target functions, the number of training points you need to achieve a particular level of generalization error uh, grows exponentially. And this is obviously not something that we're going to be able to satisfy as we do learning in extremely large dimensions. So does this mean we should give up? Well, no. In reality, deep learning is still quite successful over high dimensional structured inputs. But basically, we don't use fully connected MLPs in most cases for those kinds of inputs. So what we do instead is we, in we inject whatever we can assume about the geometry of our data through these inductive biases that change our architecture such that it's not uh, the same set of functions as before. So the hypothesis space of an MLP is huge, but now our hypothesis space might be much smaller to just functions that respect that underlying geometry. And because you have a much smaller set of functions to fit with some properties guaranteed by the mathematics of those models, this now makes your high dimensional problem still cursed, but more tractable. And uh, there's, I'll give just a handful of popular examples for what do I mean when I say capturing geometry inside the machine learning model. One very common example is that image data should be processed in the same way, regardless of how I shift it. It is still the same image. The object has just changed its place then you can even generalize this to a more exotic domain. For example, the domain of a sphere. Uh, very often spherical data arises when you have measurements taken on the surface of the earth. And basically when you have data on a sphere like this smiley face over here, it is still the same smiley face no matter how I choose to rotate it along the surface of the sphere. And my neural network that operates over the sphere should ideally be mindful of that constraint and respect it. Then the example that's closest to my heart, the graphs, uh, basically you can present graphs to a model in many, many different ways, but they might actually be exactly the same graph. So as long as there are two graphs that are isomorphic, my graph neural network should process those two graphs the same. For example, in this case, in this picture here, you can see two graphs, they have exactly the same structure. They're just presented to you slightly differently. My graph neural network should be mindful of that and give me similar outcomes for those two graphs. So we're going to try to mathematically formalize what we mean by this, drawing heavily on the ideas of Felix Klein's uh, Erlangen program. 
in order to be able to talk about uh, what it means for you know our functions and our inputs and our domains to be respectful of some kind of geometry, we need to be very concrete about what uh, our neural networks are operating over. And to do that, we need to define uh, a notion of a signal. So specifically, first of all, we define uh, our domain, a set omega, as the set of all of the points uh, on which we are recording data. Okay, so for example, of images, omega can be Zn times Zn, which is an n by n grid, and every single point on omega corresponds to a particular pixel in an image, right? Now, of course, we don't just want to have a domain. We usually, in deep learning, want to attach features to this domain. So we also need some kind of a feature space C, which for purposes of deep learning is usually some kind of low or high dimensional vector space. So in the case of image data, C is just R to the three. It's a three dimensional real vector giving you red, green, and blue intensities for a particular pixel. And now a signal is any mapping, any function from points on omega to their corresponding features, right? So when you talk about this, you can now talk about uh, the space of C-valued signals, X of omega C, which is just the collection of all possible functions that map omega to C. And one thing that's going to be very convenient for us, because with deep learning, we often work in the domain of linear algebra, is that usually, even if our domain omega is continuous, to put it into a computer, we have to discretize it in some way. So very often the omegas we care about are actually going to be discrete. So in these cases, we can represent our signal as a matrix rather than as a function. Uh, this feature matrix capital X, which is equal to uh, just some real matrix that has number of rows equal to the number of points in the domain and number of columns equal to the dimensionality of our feature space, such that the ith row of this uh, feature map, uh, sorry, of this feature matrix gives us the features of the ith node of the domain. Okay, and very often you can assume additional interesting properties on these signals. For example, you typically assume a Hilbert space structure, which means that you're able to arbitrarily compute linear combination of signals and multiplications by scalars by just pushing in those operations as much as possible. And often, if you have an inner product over your feature space C, you can then also compute an inner product between two uh, between two uh, signals by just uh, integrating appropriately over omega itself uh, and at every point in omega taking the pointwise uh, inner product between the features on those two points. So you can often build this kind of Hilbert space structure. Depending on how far we get today, I might have a chance to use it to show you how to build neural networks over a sphere, but uh, this is just uh, an important point that we often are able to attach this. Now, then we got the preliminaries out of the way. Let's talk about our main event. We say it's all about being resistant to symmetries. So what is a symmetry? A symmetry is a transformation of an object that leaves it unchanged for all intents and purposes. And I feel like this is something that's best visualized on a particular example. So here is one particular example that we often like to give as a, as a first example. Imagine that my domain omega is a triangle with three points, the three corners of the triangle. And the kinds of symmetry operations we could do to that triangle are rotations, R, and horizontal flips, F. And every single one of those operations changes the way we perceive the three corners, but it doesn't change what triangle we're looking at. We're just looking at it from a different perspective. So if we want to build a model that is resistant to these kinds of transformations, our symmetries will incorporate these two particular operations over triangles. Okay? Now, the very act of you saying that a symmetry leaves the object unchanged immediately draws with it certain mathematical properties. For example, the identity transformation must be a symmetry pretty much by definition. If I have two symmetries, I must be able to compose them and I will still get a symmetry as a result because neither of them dropped any information about my input. And also because it leaves the object unchanged, I must be able to invert it. And the inverse must itself be a symmetry. You collect all of those properties together and you realize that actually uh, these axioms recover a very standard mathematical object, which is a group, right? Now, in case you're not familiar with groups or you haven't come across them in a while, I've just curated a slide where I repeated all of the main axioms of a group. So a group is just any set, any abstract set 
with a binary operation combining two elements of that set such that you satisfy associativity, there exists an, a unique identity, there's an inverse for every element, and the set is closed under this binary operation. And just to give you another example of a symmetry group, on the right-hand side, you can see one of my personal favorite examples of a symmetry group, which are the symmetries of the Rubik's Cube, okay? So this is basically uh, what we are playing with. But one thing that's important to note is that, you know, a symmetry group is a group of transformations of the domain and allowing us to compose, but it's a very specific instantiation of the abstract concept of a group, which is just a set of elements with some composition rule. So what we really need to specify concretely, if we want to use these to reason about how they affect data, is to talk about a concept of a group action. So a group action is a map which takes a particular group element and a particular point on our domain and transforms it onto some other point of the domain. And it must satisfy the expected properties of uh, if I want to uh, transform a point on the domain with two group transformations, it doesn't matter if I first act on it with one, then act on it with the other, or compose them and then act on it with the composition. And also the identity must leave me in the same point I started. So these are kind of the obvious properties, but they must hold. And here is one specific example of what a group action might look like. So in the case of, say, rotations and translations in a two-dimensional space, uh, those are parametrized by a polar angle theta and by the translation coordinates tx, ty. You can actually reason about that particular group element as an action specified by a three-dimensional matrix. You might know this from computer, for computer graphics, that you can build these 3D matrices that act on 2D coordinates and then translate and rotate them appropriately. You just build kind of a combination of a rotation matrix with a translation component on the side. So this is how it works. And this is how to convert the group element, which is theta tx ty, into something that can actually act on the points in R squared. And uh, this now leads us to a very important formula, which allows us to say not only how the group acts on points of the domain, but also how it acts on data, the signals, okay? So imagine I have some signal X on the domain and I want to act on it with a group action. That is the same as if I were to look up the signal in the point that will end up on use place once I apply the group action. That's the reason why here is a G to the minus one in the expression. Because after I apply G, the G and G to the minus one will cancel and that point will line up exactly in use place. Or put differently, if you imagine I have this signal X over the surface of my sphere, and I have G which rotates the sphere, I'm looking for the point that will end up in a particular place after I rotate the sphere, which is the same as if I took that point and rotated it in the opposite direction by that same amount, okay? So this is the key idea of why this formula works the way it does. And we can often also assume for convenience that our group action will be a linear operation. And this means that uh, if I have a particular action on my signals, and I have a combination of signals, it doesn't matter if I combine them first and then act, or first act on the two signals and then combine them. As you can see here on the pictures of two insects, I can either first add them and then shift it downwards, or first shift them downwards and add them, the result image is still the same. So this is what we mean by the group action being linear. And Assuming that our group action is linear, we can talk about it in the realm of linear algebra very conveniently using a concept of a group representation. So specifically, what I mean when I say a group real representation, I mean I have this map, this row, which takes a particular group element and gives me a unique invertible n by n matrix, which has the effect that when I multiply it with my signals, it's the same as if I uh, as if I applied the group action onto those signals. And it must also satisfy this compositionality rule. So if I want to compose two group actions, G and H, it is the same as if I uh, either first compose them in the group space, then take their representation, or take their separate representations and then multiply those two matrices together. That, that has to be the same effect, right? And here is one specific easy example of that. Uh, imagine I have a one-dimensional uh, sequence input. So my domain omega is, say, Z5, which means a sequence of five elements. And my group corresponds to circular shifts. So my group is defined by Z. So it's all the integer shifts I can apply to this sequence. Uh, 
and uh, a particular action applied on my data, which is arranged in the sequence of five objects, is just you take this shift matrix over here, that's the representation of moving by one element to the right, and then you just raise it to the nth power if you want to move n steps to the side, right? This is the real representation of shifting a sequence by one position to the right, circularly, of course. Because if you don't have a circular shift, you lose information and uh, then it's no longer a symmetry. So now that you have this idea of a real representation, we can finally exploit, we'll talk about what it means for some function or some neural network to exploit the symmetries inside our symmetry group. So first, uh, one important concept is that of invariance. We can say that our function f, uh, which maps our signals on the domain to some outputs y, some labels, uh, it is g invariant if no matter what uh, group action I choose, no matter what g I choose, it doesn't matter if I apply it to the input, I will still get exactly the same output. One special case of this is, say, an image classification. Your output class typically is assumed not to depend on image shifts. So an object is still in the image no matter where it is. And this is the essence behind convolutional neural networks, uh, how they're built, right? But sometimes we don't care about having a single label for the whole domain omega, uh, which is what the first definition is about. We sometimes might also care about predicting something in every single element of omega. So now we have a function that maps signals on omega to different signals of omega. And actually here invariance is not what we want anymore because we, if we do perform an action on the input, that action should also be appropriately applied in the output. It's not that the output should be exactly the same. So we need a more fine-grained notion, which we call G equivariance. And it goes like this. For any group operation I choose, it doesn't matter if I apply it to the input or to the output of my function, it is still the same result. So a group action affects the input and output of F in the same way. And one simple example of this, again, in the domain of images is image segmentation, right? Because when you produce a segmentation of an image, it gives a segmentation mask. And then if I choose to shift my input image, I know it's guaranteed by the convolution operator that the mask will shift by exactly the same amount. This is guaranteed mathematically by the operation. It's not something I have to learn, okay? So this is the idea of equivariance. Now, invariance and equivariance are the key ingredients for building geometric deep learning architectures, but there is another important constraint, which is not important mathematically, but it's important numerically because you could end up building a perfect invariant equivariant function and it still numerically blows up when you apply it to the real world. And why is that? Well, it's because the domain, like, you know, nature doesn't always act on data in terms of perfect symmetries uh, or at least the perfect symmetries we would anticipate. So in this particular setting, let me once again illustrate it on the image domain with a picture of a house. So I have a particular picture of a house here. When I build a convolutional neural network over that image, I now know I can rest easily knowing that I am resistant to any kind of shifts of that picture of a house. It was still gonna be recognized exactly the same way. However, nature will not just give me a shifted picture of a house. It might give me a shifted image with some additional pixel distortions. So I might get a picture that looks a little bit like the one in the bottom. You know, among other things, different cameras capture inputs in different ways, right? And there are all sorts of interesting transformations that the convolutional neural network is not designed to predict, okay? And in this case, we still want our network to gracefully behave. Like we don't want it to look at these distortions and let the inputs blow up and not be able to do anything in the output space. And uh, there's a lot of interesting mathematics behind how to ensure this kind of geometric stability to deformations and distortions. But uh, the rough conclusion, I don't have enough time in this talk to go through it. The conclusion that we discuss in our proto book mm -hmm. is that the way to secure this is by making your layers local. And this is the reason why convolutional networks are built often with very small convolutions, like three by three convolutions, but then you make them very deep to propagate across the entire uh, parts of your input. Uh, this is, um, this is this basically guarantees that every single pixel only talks to the immediate neighboring pixels in the image. So even if there is a distortion somewhere in the input, it doesn't propagate everywhere globally immediately, but it stays trapped inside that small three by three square without messing up much of the rest of your much of the rest of your data. And this allows your network to more gracefully deal with these errors. That's basically the intuition. 
Now, all of these things combined, I can now tell you about a blueprint that combines all the building blocks of geometric deep learning. So we have various domains, omega, symmetry groups over omega G, and we also talk about compacted versions of omega. We can now define four key building blocks. Two of them you've already seen. So there is a notion of an G equivariant layer, which maps signals on omega to different signals uh, on omega, such that uh, the equivariance property is satisfied. And there's also a G invariant layer in case you want predictions not only over individual points in omega, but over the whole domain omega. This uh, is sometimes also referred to as global pooling, right? Because it pulls the entire domain into a single prediction, right? And in case that's necessary, you can add it to the end of your network, right? Now, you might notice in the definition of the equivariant layers that I also wrote that they are local to satisfy the geometric stability. And I also wrote that they are linear, okay? Now, why is it enough to talk about linear and why should we only talk about linear? First of all, solving for linear equivariant layers is something that mathematically is much easier to do than solving for nonlinear equivariant layers, okay? Uh, basically, it's sometimes even going to be possible to characterize exactly what is the collection of layers that will be linear equivariant to a particular group. And say in the case of convolutions, so images and translations, you can prove it's a well-known fact in signal processing that the only linear equivariant layers are convolutions. Nothing else satisfies this uh, shift equivariance uh, over images. And uh, the reason why it's sufficient for us to talk about linear equivariant layers is because in deep learning, we typically add nonlinearity in a different way, rather by applying these pointwise activation functions, right? So you compute whatever it is you need uh, with your linear layer. And then for every single point of your feature space, you apply some activation like ReLU or sigmoid or tanch or something like that. And for many of these domains, we already have proofs that if you compose linear equivariants with pointwise nonlinearities, that is sufficiently expressive to cover every nonlinear function that you might want to express, okay? So there is a good reason why we explicitly split the searching for the linear equivariants with searching for nonlinearities. One thing that we're not going to talk about that much in today's talk, but it is quite important if you want to do any kind of hierarchical uh, representations over your input, and surely it was quite popular in the earlier approaches to image processing, is this idea of a coarsening or pooling layer, which uh, maps signals on omega to signals on some smaller omega prime, such that the structure of omega is somehow preserved inside omega prime. So this is basically what allows us to do things like max pooling in images and stuff like that. So this allows us to switch from a bigger domain to a smaller one. And you take all of these building blocks, you compose them together, Effectively, you have now a stack of linear equivariant layers with nonlinearities interspersed between them. You also attach some local pooling layers in case you want to uh, course in your domain in some way. And lastly, if you want a prediction over all the points in omega, you attach an invariant global pooling layer at the end. And we argue that this blueprint over here is uh, sufficient to express basically all of deep learning that we really care about today. And you really shouldn't just take my word for it. We have been able to show in our GDL proto book that you can derive basically all of the fan favorites as special cases of this particular blueprint. Once again, showing how powerful Felix Klein's Erlangen program is in this particular deep learning domain. So you can rederive a lot of your fan favorites like CNNs, GNNs, deep sets, transformers, LSTMs, by choosing an appropriate domain omega and an appropriate symmetry group G that you want to be invariant or equivariant to. But what's really cool about it is that uh, effectively, uh, this doesn't just allow us to explain the really popular architectures. It also allows us to talk about architectures over exotic domains that people might not necessarily be thinking about that much, but they basically fall out as a result of our blueprint analysis. So it allows you to talk about things like neural networks over spheres, like spherical CNNs, or even neural networks over general manifolds. So what we actually believe is that our blueprint is not only helpful as a way to categorize things that already exist to reveal hidden connections, but also to help us on the journey to discovering new architectures in the future based on what are the properties of our domain we want to respect and what are the symmetry operations that we want to be resistant to. So 
hopefully this is why it's useful. And in the remainder of this talk, I'm going to try to show you as much as possible, as many examples as possible of this blueprint in action, deriving concrete architectures as a result. So let's get going. This is roughly the collection of architectures I would hope to cover today. I probably won't be able to cover all of them, but hopefully I'll give you enough examples uh, to see how we can arrive at all of these popular collections of architectures by looking at a domain and looking at a particular symmetry group and deriving an equivariance or invariance condition. So let's start with sets. Sets are arguably the easiest domain with absolutely no obvious geometry attached to them, right? So specifically, it's like a graph with no edges. So our domain omega is just a collection of nodes V, and we assume no particular connections between those nodes. So as we said before, in deep learning, we care about featureizing these nodes. So we will say Xi are the features of node I. It's like a k-dimensional real vector describing the features of that particular node. And uh, as you know, there's many ways you can present these to a machine learning model. As we discussed with our signals discussion, you can stack these features into a node feature matrix of the shape number of nodes times number of features, this capital X. And... Now, I need to stress on you that in the context of sets, like when we dealt with 1D sequences, there was an ordering between these nodes. But when we talk about sets, there's no notion of ordering. And the very act of us putting features in a matrix like this is very bad because it specifies an ordering. And we would want our neural networks to not depend on the ordering because I told you at the beginning, this set is unordered. So any choice of how to order nodes is a purely arbitrary choice. So what we really want is this property called permutation invariance, which means that uh, if I take a set and I choose to perturb it in some way, so still present you the same set, but the rows are disordered, I want my outputs to still stay the same, and I want this mathematically guaranteed. So what does this mean in the geometric deep learning context? My symmetry group is the n element permutation group, so it's a group that gives me all the permutations of n elements. And uh, I want my model to be equivariant or invariant to those transformations. So specifically, we can now talk about permutations that are operations that change the order of the nodes. As you know, for n objects, there's n factorial, many of them. And uh, what's very convenient is we can literally use the idea of real representations that I told you about before and express every permutation as a group action, which can be encoded into a node by node matrix known as a permutation matrix. Each permutation specifies exactly one. And uh, as you can see from this uh, equation, they're very special, the permutation matrices. There's zero almost everywhere. There's only one one in every row and every column. And the only effect that they have is that when you left multiply them with your node feature matrices, you get those same node features, but permuted, right? And that's exactly the group action that we want to be resistant to, right? So now we can apply our usual rule to derive a rule for equivariance or invariance over sets. Like no matter what permutation I take, I should either get the same output or I should get appropriately permuted outputs. And uh, we also need locality, which leads us to derive what is now known popularly as a deep sets architecture. So one way to get equivariance and locality is to just transform every set element separately. So there's a shared function psi applied to each xi vector to get uh, embedding vectors hi. And then in case you want something over the entire set as a prediction, you add a permutation invariant tail to this architecture. So some operator O plus, which you can think of it as any permutation invariant operation, like summing, averaging, maximizing, or anything like this, anything which doesn't depend on the order of the operands you apply it to all of your set elements after you've applied Psi, and then you apply five, which is another neural network that predicts your outputs. And you can see here immediately the blueprint of geometric deep learning in action in this particular architecture, right? This is a very standard state-of-the-art architecture for processing set data. Also, for those of you coming from computer vision, you might know this architecture as point nets. Every single blue component here is a local linear equivariant layer with some nonlinearities put in between. And the part in red, the O plus and phi, are the invariant part predicting things uh, over the whole set. Now, this is, of course, just one possible function that satisfies the permutation, equivariance, and invariance constraints. 
However, you can actually show that over unordered sets before without assuming any edges between the elements, this is actually as far as you can get. So you give me any set uh, function, which is permutation invariant, you can prove, and the deep sets paper proved this for a lot of uh, input spaces, you can actually re-express that function always in this format over here. So this format over here is actually a universal format for building functions over sets. And as I said just now, it, the applicability of it goes well beyond pure set data. It's seen application in computer vision as well, like the point net model. And if you look at the architecture of the point net model, which is a very potent model for learning from point clouds, it looks exactly the same as deep sets. You have a shared MLP applied to every single point. And at the end, you apply a particular pooling operation. In this case, they use max pooling to get features for the entire point cloud. Now, of course, the very interesting stuff starts to happen when you start to allow different set elements to interact. And this allows us to jump from learning on sets to learning on graphs. So now we have a set of nodes, but we also have a set of edges. Our domain omega now becomes a set of nodes and a set of edges. And there's many ways we can represent these edges, but we tend to prefer to use the adjacency matrices mathematically here, just because we're talking about everything in terms of linear algebra. So we might as well talk about uh, this in terms of linear algebra as well. As you might know, for the computer scientists in the room, there are more efficient ways to represent edges than to put them in an adjacency matrix, but this is just mathematically convenient, okay? And uh, as you probably know, an adjacency matrix A is a nodes times nodes matrix with uh, ones and zeros, where ones tell you where the edges are and zeros tell you where they are not. There are many other things you can put in edges, like uh, edge features, edge, uh, you know, node distances, node similarities, and stuff like that. We're deliberately ignoring that for now to keep the math simple, but you can always put those features back in, and uh, kind of the math is still the same, just a bit more tedious. So one question is, once we've done this, once we went from the domain of sets and introduced these additional edges, what has actually changed? To be fair, nothing has really changed. The main desiderata being invariant and equivariant to permutations is still there. So if you look at this uh, picture, which explained what was necessary for a function over sets to be permutation invariant, when you talk about graphs, it's really exactly the same picture. The only difference is that now these objects have some edges between them. And whenever I permute them, I need to be careful to permute the edges in exactly the same way. But otherwise, the rules are exactly the same. You can apply exactly the same blueprints to go from learning on sets to learning on graphs by just plugging in a different domain, but the symmetry group is exactly the same. So you can derive invariance and equivariance constraints just like you did for sets. The only difference is that now you also have these edges that arrive as an input to the function. So it's part of the input to F. And whenever I do a permutation on my nodes, I need to accordingly permute my edges. As we said, ed uh, edges are given in an adjacency matrix, which is nodes by nodes. And a way to permute them, you need to permute now both the rows and the columns of that matrix, which numerically in terms of linear algebra translates to PAP transposed. The first uh, matrix multiply uh, permutes the rows. The second matrix multiply permutes the columns, right? But other than that, the invariance and equivariance conditions are exactly the same. Invariance means if I permute the nodes in my graph and the edges accordingly, I'll still get the same answer. Equivariance means if I permute my graph, it doesn't matter if I do it before or after applying my function. It's the same idea. Now, of course, the one part where graphs get more interesting than sets is the idea of locality. Because on sets, we really had no knowledge of connections between the nodes. So the only way we could enforce uh, locality is by treating every node separately with that function Psi. But now in graphs, we now have a context for locality. A node has its neighbors in the graph. So for every single node, we can compute Ni, which is the set of its one hop neighbors in the graph or multi hop neighbors, depending on how you want to do it. We just do one hop uh, without loss of generality. Once you have the Ni set, you can also extract all of the neighborhood features X and I. So this is now a multi-set of all the X vectors for all of your neighbors. The reason why I use multi-set, which is the double curly brackets, is because I could have multiple neighbors with the same features. And this basically makes sure that I count them properly, which sets would not count duplicates. And now my local function doesn't just have to look at one node, but it can look at that node and all of the node features in the neighborhood. Okay, so 
what now is really changed is you can now take this local function and as before, apply it to every neighborhood in isolation and stack the updated features as your new node features. And this is a recipe with which you can build graph neural networks. Well, there is one important caveat, right? Because now I'm presenting this collection of neighbors to, um, to each of these local functions, phi. I need to be careful that phi processes them in the same way, no matter how I choose to present them. And uh, basically, um, uh, this means that phi must be permutation invariant on these neighborhood features. And as long as phi is invariant, f will, as a whole will be permutation equivariant. It's a fun exercise, a simple algebraic manipulation. If you have some time after this talk to try to prove this, to go away and prove this for yourself. It's a simple manipulation, but it's a great way to check that you've understood the key concepts. Now, what I wanna say here is I've given you a whole load of math uh, to derive what a graph neural network is. But in reality, all that this thing is telling us is this picture over here, right? Everything we've talked about now for graphs has led us to this picture. We say that a way in which we compute updated features on the nodes of a graph is by looking at the features of a particular node, the features of all of its one hop neighbors, and our local function phi then updates the features of a particular node using that neighborhood information. And that's it. When I give talks to a non-technical audience, I start by this slide. I start by telling them, yeah, graph nets kind of look at one hop neighbors and that's it, right? And you kind of have to believe me that that's why it works. Whereas with a more technical audience, I can actually start from the first principles and derive this architecture from the permutation and variance constraint, which I believe should be helpful to you because it might help you recognize many more architectures that are similar in this way. For example, one very fun thing you can try to observe is that the transformers are a special case of a graph neural network because once you attach the positional embeddings, it is basically just a permutation equivariant function over the complete graph of tokens. So once you have a model like this, how can you use it to learn stuff on graphs? Once again, applying the geometric deep learning blueprint, we have a particular graph structured input with node features X and adjacency matrix A. My graph neural network, as we discussed, will update each node's features by taking into account its immediate neighbors in a permutation equivariant way. Typically, the adjacency matrix A will not be modified, although there's been a lot of interesting developments recently with GNNs that can modify A. We're just, to keep the math simple, we're not factoring those in right now. And now that I have these H vectors, what can I do with them? Well, if my task is to classify things in nodes, for example, to classify topics of documents in a citation network, or in the context of Google Maps, which I worked on personally, to classify travel time on a particular segment of the road network so that Google Maps can then serve you how fast you or slowly you will travel to your place of work. This is a node classification problem where you take the features of a particular node and you predict the output. And in this case, because it's the same function applied to every node feature, it's a purely fully equivariant function. You might instead want to classify entire graphs. For example, your graph could be a molecule and you might want to predict its uh, drug properties or chemical properties or something like that. So now you're classifying the whole molecule for some overall graph property, graph classification. And you can do this, of course, but you have to be careful about the ordering of the individual H vectors. So you can do the same trick as we did for deep sets, an invariant layer at the tail, which runs on each HI vector, combines them together using O plus and then sends that to a graph classifier. Graphs also offer one other fun equivariant prediction, which is a prediction that happens in the edges. And nowadays, people often refer to all edge prediction problems as link prediction, even though historically it only referred to a specific subproblem of detecting whether edges even exist or not. Once again, you can build a classifier that looks at the features of the two relevant nodes and any edge features you might have between them. And this gives you an equivariant prediction in the edges. This is really cool because it's the essence, like this particular pipeline is the backbone behind most recommendation systems in use today. So whether it is to find new content on Pinterest, find what food to eat on Uber Eats, find out where to sleep next in Airbnb, or uh, you know, or find out which product to buy next on Amazon, all of those pipelines are, are powered in production by graph neural networks running on top of link prediction systems. So this explains how billions of billions of people interact with machine learning on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, 
I haven't actually told you how this local function phi is implemented, right? I just told you there is a local function that looks at a node and its immediate neighbors and it updates the features based on that. So the missing link on how to build a graph neural network is uh, how to implement that local function. But uh, this is not the key detail for what I'm telling you about today. So I am deliberately skipping that for this talk. I will just quickly say that in our book, we propose a categorization of these local message passing flavors from convolutional to attentional to message passing. As you go left to right, the computations you do over the edges get more complicated. And so convolutional are the most scalable and most interesting for large scale industrial problems, but they're obviously limited in what they can express. Message passing is the most expressive, prone to overfitting, lots of parameters, lots of scalability implications, but they're really good for the kinds of problems where edges are really just a recipe for passing messages, and therefore they're great for computational physics, computational chemistry, reasoning, and those kinds of problems. And in the middle, you have the middle ground where you compute only a small scalar of interaction along every edge, and then you compute uh, updates as you would before. The attentional flavor, which kind of lives in the middle of these two approaches, and sort of gives you the best of both worlds, it should come as no surprise that transformers live in this particular region in the middle. And in fact, you can say by analyzing the rule of the transformer that it's basically an attentional graph neural network over the fully connected uh, graph. And you might be wondering, okay, but if it's operating over a complete graph with permutation symmetry, how do I tell it that it's looking at sentences? Because that's where transformers came from. Well, the way you tell the transformer it's looking at a sentence is by giving it positional embeddings, right? But the positional embeddings only tell you, like they tell the model as a feature, where is every node as a token in a word, but the model is not at all forced to use that information. Like the mathematics of the transformer does not guarantee that it will be meaningfully using this sequence in any way, shape or form. It's really just a hint. So the actual symmetries guaranteed by the transformer are just permutation symmetries. And you can imagine the attention coefficients as kind of inferring a soft adjacency matrix and letting the GNN choose its own edges. Now, uh, I think this is a super fascinating connection. There's a lot more that can be said about it, but unfortunately I do not have enough time in this talk to go in depth. So if you're interested in the fascinating connection that arises here, Chaitanya Joshi wrote a fantastic blog post for the gradient titled literally transformers are graph neural networks, which we'll talk about explicitly how the equations of the two models can be connected to each other. Okay, so there's obviously a lot more models that I could potentially guide you through. But I also realized that we are approaching the 45, 50 minute mark. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to quickly show you how this concept can be generalized over geometric graphs, and then we can open the floor to some questions. So to give you a feel, so far we assume that our graphs are discrete, unordered set of nodes and edges, but in many cases that's not the whole story, right? Your graph might be a molecule, for example, so your nodes are atoms that live in some three-dimensional space. So the space itself might have some geometry, and it will be very useful to us to use this geometry beyond the notion of just doing permutation symmetry. So molecules are a classical case. They're not just two-dimensional objects floating around. They occupy 3D space in a very specific configuration. And uh, the idea of exploiting this spatial geometry is very useful if you go to even bigger molecules like proteins. You probably all know about the successes of AlphaFold. One of the key building blocks that made AlphaFold successful is a geometric attention that leverages equivariance to, uh, to spatial symmetries. So what we are going to assume, just as a quick way to kind of uh, uh, talk about this in a more kind of uh, specific environment, is we're going to assume that our nodes not only have features now, fu, but also have coordinates, xu. So now each node is a point, say, in three-dimensional space, which has some features on top of that. For example, what is the atom type or something like that. So now if I want to build a message passing model that is a graph neural network, but also equivariant, it must transform these two features separately. So we update uh, the features uh, as well as the coordinates. And we can now talk about an additional symmetry group, not just permutations that we would like to be resistant to. In the case of molecules, one very common assumption is the Euclidean group, E3, which allows you to rotate, translate, and reflect the molecule. Usually these are fair assumptions, especially if the molecule is sitting in a vacuum. If you rotate it, translate it, and reflect it, and you're just analyzing that particular molecule in isolation, the output should really stay the same. Like it is still the same molecule, just presented to you in a different perspective. 
So for any 3D orthogonal matrix and a translation vector, you can talk about the group action as a rotation followed by a translation. And if you apply this to coordinate features, it should typically not affect the features that are otherwise in the molecule. And there are, of course, many GNNs that obey this particular equivariance constraint. One very popular model that solves for EN equivariance was exposed by Victor Garcia Satoras and others at ICML a few years ago, which basically modifies the usual GNN rule that I showed you before, but such that now the message functions, sorry, only look at the features of the two nodes, not the axes, and they only include axes as the distance between them. This is important because the Euclidean group is an isometry action, so it doesn't change distances between the points when you rotate them, translate them, and stuff like that. And that way you're guaranteed that your features F prime will be transformed in exactly the same way if you rotate or translate the axes. There is also a similar rule to update axes in a way that, once again, will equivariantly rotate and translate if you rotate and translate the input. And there's obviously something very elegant about this rule, but there you need to be worried about cases where potentially the features you put in your atoms now also depend on the space and the geometry. For example, very often in physics, you might be interested in tracking vector forces between the atoms or forces that act on a particular atom. And if you now rotate the molecule, it needs to also rotate the forces. And the previous model would not take that into account. So one way in which you can handle that, and in the original paper, Satoras and others pro proposed this directly, is to just include vectors as an additional feature. And uh, now you can have an extra rule that deals with vectors. And uh, now the whole model, once again, is equivariant in the expected way. This is an issue that will keep reappearing as you tensor up your features. And I will just quickly say that it is actually possible to talk about general set of solutions that works for EN equivariance uh, without having to make a new rule every single time that you tensor up what your features in the nodes are. And this solution basically boils down to tensor field networks that look at irreducible representations of this uh, specific uh, special Euclidean group. We don't have enough time to talk about the details, but tensor field networks, as well as its follow-up for the transformer domain, the SE3 transformer, are fantastic references if you want to look up more about it. So I will skip all this discussion about manifolds because we don't have enough time. And I will just quickly say, we talked about invariance and equivariance as symmetry groups. We talked about deep sets as a model to do permutation equivariant learning on sets. We talked about GNNs as an extension to build permutation equivariant models on graphs. We talked about transformers as a special case of fully connected attentional GNNs. We talked about how you can compose the permutation symmetry with some geometric symmetry to build a geometric graph neural network. And finally, uh, I didn't have time to mention this, but this really ties in very nicely to learning over general manifolds, because when you discretize them, you end up with a mesh, which is basically qualitatively very similar to a geometric graph. We're very actively trying to improve all of this content for our GDL book, which is currently scheduled to be released this year with MIT Press. So at this particular point, if you have any and all feedback, it's super welcome. I will once again point you to geometricdeeplearning.com if any of this triggered your interest and you'd like to learn more. And I think at this point, it will be good to uh, stop and maybe take a few questions. Thanks again for having me. Well, thanks a lot, Petar, for this very, very nice talk. So now it's time for questions. Please write your name in the chat. In uh, Well, of course, Carlos, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Pablo. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was like uh, really, really interesting. Uh, so my question is, uh, from what I've understood, like you focused at uh, the presentation, like on talking about this uh, uh, invariance and equivariances, like analyzing the different uh, deep neural architecture, like deep set, etc. And I think you've uh, dropped like some hints about how to do the opposite process. So like given a, a signal space and, a, and a, uh, I think you said a symmetry group of a, of a set of operations that you would like to preserve, how to obtain a neural network architecture that does that. Because I think at the start you, saw, you said, we think that the graph neural networks could be the way to do this because you have convolution, you have attention, you have all of these things. And you said, for example, in the case of deep sets that uh, this is all the all we, all we can obtain and this set of function is equivalent to other, I suppose, deep sets architecture. So 
Okay, so, so my question like to summarize would be, let's say that you're given a signal space. So this is how your data is represented and you're given like a symmetry group. So I, I know that this data, like I, I know for sure as prior knowledge, it preserves a uh, Euclidean transformation, it preserves, uh, it preserves like uh, permutation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can you derive like an algorithm for obtaining a specific, uh, a specific maybe a novel neural architecture that you know it will preserve those uh, those symmetries and you can just train it like you know for example in terms of flow perform back propagation uh, so that's my first question okay yeah thanks for that thanks for your comments on the talk glad you enjoyed it and it's a very nice question i will just say yes for some cases where your groups follow a nice discrete pattern it is possible to automatically generate a neural network architecture that will respect those symmetries um, I forgot the name of the library. I think it's called E3NN or something like that. There's several on GitHub nowadays that try to basically automatically build uh, neural networks that respect certain symmetry groups. Maybe it's not E3NN. There's a few of those floating around. But basically, uh, maybe check out the work of Mario Geiger. I think he worked on it quite a bit. Sometimes it's possible to do automatically. But some symmetry groups are actually really exotic, and it's really hard to automatically arrive at an architecture just by knowing the symmetry group, partly because the group is very complicated or because of the main omega is very complicated. So what often happens really is that humans or mathematicians have to leverage some existing knowledge about this group, like what are its irreducible representations or what are some special cases of this equivariance constraint to arrive at even approximate symmetric architectures. So... In some cases, yes, we can get exact equivariance, and the Euclidean group is one case where this is possible. But for example, I know that uh, in some uh, quantum chromodynamics projects that were done at DeepMind, they had to do a, a gauge equivariance to the SU group, and there they could only do approximate equivariance because you know the exact solution in neural network form was just not known, right? But yes, in many cases that we're going to talk that we talked about here which are coincidentally also the most standard deep learning architectures, you kind of just know what these operators are, either by knowing the mathematical analysis or it just feels right. Yeah, but uh, okay. yeah, so maybe this answers your question. Yeah, it does, thank you. And my second question was like related to the first one is, given like uh, your training data, uh, can you extract a set of symmetries that are preserved? For example, uh, you obtain a training data and you don't know if it corresponds to images, messages, graphs, whatever, and you maybe discover that when you apply a certain uh, a group of, let's say, um, operations, uh, the label associated remains the same. So then you say, okay, maybe this preserves shifting variants and that could lead you into choosing an appropriate architecture or even in those cases, you said it was possible to automatically derive an architecture with those symmetries, have like the a complete like a automatic pipeline that from data to a set of symmetries that are preserved to a architecture that uh, preserves those symmetries, like kind of like an evolution maybe of auto machine learning, kind of? So maybe just to say, like, this is a question I get every time I present this talk. So it's something we've thought about a fair bit. Um, our book specifically concerns about the case where you know what the symmetry group in the domain is, just because it's already very complicated when you do that. That being said, there's been some pretty exciting work recently that tries to discover what quantities are conserved inside particular inputs. Uh, one specific example that I particularly like, and it's also inspired by the work of Emmy Neuther, whom I mentioned at the start of my talk, are these so-called Neuther networks. And uh, the work is done by Ferran Alet and his, uh, and his collaborators at MIT. And uh, here, what they do is they basically use meta-learning to try to find functions of the form f of x equals zero. So a neural network uh, tries to estimate what inside your data is always equal to zero by learning a function that uh, kind of reduces to zero and kind of in a meta-learned way when you regularize with that function as a, as a loss gives you better performance. So there are methods to kind of approximately extract laws of conservation from inputs already. But they are really challenging, let's just say. And even in the graph domain, like figuring out what the true graph is that you want to apply permutation symmetry to 
is a very important and complicated open problem because even the ground truth graphs that we have from nature are not necessarily always the best graphs for solving these problems. So anyway, in summary, it's a super challenging problem. Because it's super challenging, we decided not to focus on it in this particular context. It was already quite hard as it is. But I would check out works like Noether Networks and Latent Graph Inference to kind of see what people have been sort of trying in this space if you're interested. Okay, so it seems like in the general case, the machine learning engineer, it's a still necessary like to come up with the architecture and to come up with symmetries. <laughs> I see so. Maybe in the future it won't be necessary, but today I would say definitely yes. I see, I see. Thank you very much for your answers. No worries, thanks for asking. Thank you very much. So we have another question. Uh, Jose Perez Cano, please go ahead. Yes. Well, my question is about which kind of current networks are not represented in this paradigm, because throughout the talk, you've mentioned that this works for almost everything, but not for everything. So I would like to see an example of something that doesn't fit here. Right. So you mean an architecture which cannot be expressed using... Uh, yeah, or a problem or something that doesn't <laughs> have those symmetries or any symmetry. Right. So, okay, I will give you one example uh, without going into too much depth. Um, what I do these days quite a bit in my day-to-day -day research, uh, as, uh, as Pablo mentioned in the introduction, is I work a lot on algorithmic reasoning problems. So I'm trying to build the neural architectures that respect computations of classical algorithms in such a way that like, if you imagine your algorithm as running in the bottom of the diagram and your GNN is running in the top of the diagram, you want it so that, uh, you know, you want your graph network to respect the algorithm such that if I can encode an algorithmic input at time T into the GNN space and then run the GNN and decode some output, it is the same as if I were running the algorithm from the input to the output. So this is very similar to a uh, equivariance law in the case of symmetries, but I mean, how do I put this? An algorithm is not a symmetry, right? Because first of all, it doesn't have to be invertible. One step of an algorithm can delete half of your data. So you cannot really talk about inverses anymore. And also algorithms do not compose generally. An algorithm only composes with another if the output type of the first one matches the input type of the second one. So without going into too much detail, in order to be able to talk about those kinds of compositionality and uh, not symmetries, but other kinds of uh, concepts, you need to go beyond the realm of symmetries and the groups and into the realm of categories and the category theory. And what was an equivariance condition there is now a natural transformation in the context of categories. If you're interested to know more about this, the Natural Graph Networks paper that was published at the NeurIPS a few years back from Pim Dehan, Taco Coin, and Max Welling is an excellent reference for this. So that's one example. I hope it wasn't too uh, vague. Pretty interesting. Nice. Thanks. Thank you very much. And the last question, uh, Pablo Morales Alvarez, please. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hello. Um, well, thanks, Peter, for the for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, well, I, I had to disconnect some minutes, so I don't know if you may have uh, talked about this. But um, in any case, uh, in, in the last years, I've been working with um, uncertainty in in deep neural networks, and um, I was wondering whether um, the idea of uncertainty has been studied in in this context, like. Um, I don't know, in addition to having these uh, representations, having some, some, measure, some measurement of uncertainty about um, the re reliability of those representations and um, like the uncertainties of uh, adjust, adjacent nodes could be related somehow. Um, my question is just a bit general about whether uncertainty has been um, under, uh, studied in this context. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I would say that we haven't studied it uh, that much ourselves, but uh, some of the earliest definitions of, say, probabilistic graphical models also incorporated various aspects of symmetries of probability distributions. It's like a slightly different angle to how we're approaching it, but I think they're quite related. So you can and you should talk about uncertainty as much as you can in these settings. So people have definitely looked at, say, Bayesian graph neural networks and these kinds of things. 
um, where you might even be able to incorporate geometrical structure and maybe even some aspects of, say, curvature of the manifold your data lives on to quantify how uncertain you are in the prediction because, say, you might be close to a pole of the function or something like that where suddenly things go towards infinity very quickly or something like that. So just to say, it has definitely been studied. Um, we don't fo focus on it that much in this particular angle, but I think it is definitely worthwhile and there's surely going to be some uh, possible things you can look at to get started there. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, uh, this is it. I mean, we don't have time for more questions, unfortunately. But we thank, again, our speaker. Thank you very much, Peter, for this very, very nice and interesting talk. We have learned a lot. And just keep in touch. And thanks again for accepting our invitation. No worries. Thank you for having me. And if you want to reach out about anything, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to discuss more on any of these topics. Thanks a lot. You are very kind. Of course, we will do it. Thank you. And thank you to the, all the attendees for, and for the interesting questions. Mm -hmm.